especially from School of Medicine, Nurse, and Hospital Administrative. And uh, I would like to say welcome also for today, the tremendous participant attendance, which come from profession student, bachelor, and also from master student. And the agenda for today online guest lecture, uh, the first one is for the opening session, and then we continue to the main agenda, which is uh, online guest lecture for about one hour, then continue to discussion for about 30 minutes and closing. And also, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sutandri as a representative for the Dean of Faculty of Medicine and Health Science. Uh, right now, Ms. Sutandri as a head of nursing study program. And also, the team from UMY, Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, for visiting professor funding with also Dr. Supriyati Ningse, also with Professor Mike English. Hi, Professor. Okay. And to give some speech as opening session for today. And maybe please, uh, Ms. Sutantri, the time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Indy. Uh, is my voice clear? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon for the Indonesian participant and good morning for Professor Mike English uh, from uh, Oxford in UK. Uh, it is a great pleasure for us to welcome you all to this uh, distinguished to this special lecture. This is part of our visiting professor program uh, in UMW between uh, Faculty of Medicine and Health Science and also in the University of Oxford. Today, we are honored to host Professor Mike English uh, from the University of Oxford, albeit virtually. And we are uh, profoundly grateful to Prof. Uh, Mike for uh, accepting our invitation to share his uh, insights, his knowledge and experiences with us all. Um, at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, Universitas Muhammadiyah Yogyakarta, we are committed to fostering academic excellence, promoting interdisciplinary collaboration, and engaging with global leaders in healthcare research. And the Visiting Professor Program stands as a testament to this commitment, offering our students, faculty, and the wider academic community a unique opportunity to interact with esteemed experts from around the globe. And uh, Professor Mike here uh, uh, primarily focused, his work primarily focused on enhancing care in Africa District Hospital and uh, his uh, groundbreaking efforts in developing the Kenyan Hospital Network has been, I think it's instrumental in addressing health system challenge uh, in Africa. So we are really eager to learn from his expertise and innovative approach to this field. And I'm confident that today's lecture will be uh, both enlightening and also inspiring for all of us here in UMY and or for the student and also the uh, staff members of uh, Faculty of Medicine and Health Science. So once again, uh, thank you very much, Professor Mike, uh, for joining us today. And we look forward to your valuable insights and uh, knowledge sharing with us. Thank you very much and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, welcome, salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yes, thank you very much, Ms. Sutantri, for the great speech uh, today. And also we have in this Zoom room is almost 150 participants and welcome to all the participants from the profession student, master and also bachelor student and also uh, I believe we have the head of study program, Magister Hospital. Hello, Dr. Elsa. Hello. Can you hear me? Hi, Dr. Yes, we have Dr. Upi, Mr. Tantri and also Prof. Mike in here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the next agenda would be the main session, which is online guest lecture with the professor Mike English from Newfield Department of Medicine Center. And the session will be led by Dr. Supriyati Ningse, SPOG, obstetrician as a moderator, and Dr. Matt, Dr. Supriyati Ningse, MTS, SPOG, is a doctor in medical science, also obstetric and gynecology specialist, and she is very expert in cancer matter 
maternal behavior, also other academic contribution, and many, many roles for the trial coordination in research project community cervical cancer screening and prevention in Indonesia from 2021 until 2023 that funded by the German Alliance for Global Health Research and then a researcher leader of prematurity global research between Pimpinan Pusat ICA with also Newfield Department of Medicine, Oxford University until 2023 educational research and quality insurance director at uh, PKU Muhammadiyah Kamping, uh, Yogyakarta, and also as uh, uh, Muhammadiyah Maternal and Child Health Center. And many research from uh, Dr. Upi is about case report ovarian cancer stage and ovarian cancer stage 3 with Lynn syndrome. Maybe <laughs> this is, uh, I have one day to read Dr. Upi curriculum vitae. So, uh, continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we have to continue our guest lecture. So, I would like to invite Dr. Upi as a moderator today. Thank you very much. The time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farin Nira, and uh, of course, uh, Honorable uh, Professor Mike Inglis, and also uh, uh, Mrs. Susan Free and uh, the others of uh, the head uh, from many programs in uh, Muhammadiyah University. I would like to, uh, before we invite the Professor Mike English uh, to give his uh, expert lecture, I would like to announce about uh, his uh, curriculum vitae. Mike English is a professor of international child health in the Nafield Department of Medicine in Oxford University. And he is also a UK trained pediatrician who worked in Kenya for 25 years, supported by a series of welcome fellowship. In Kenya, he works as a part of the Camry Welcome Nairobi program and built up this health services unit in a collaboration with the Ministry of Health, the University of Nairobi, and wide set of national and international collaborators. His work focuses predominantly in improving care in African district hospitals, often take child and newborn health as a focus, but increasingly tackles health services or wider health system issues affecting quality of care. And Mike now as a co leads of a health system collaborative in Oxford, which is a part of the Department of Medicine Center of Global Health Research. Mike uh, continues to work uh, closely with the Kenyan colleges uh, on a range of the project. He initiated the Kenyan uh, Clinical Information uh, Network in uh, 2013 and the further developed this platform over uh, 10 years in an example of uh, the low-cost learning uh, health system. Uh, the Clinical Information Network now spans 24 Kenyan hospitals and support uh, the multiple clinical implementation and improvement project, as well as the weight of the health services and the system research. So I think uh, right now is uh, the time for us to invite him to give his expert lecture during one hour. Uh, he will give uh, the lecture uh, under the under the title "Development of Kenyan Hospital Networks as a Learning System." Uh, Professor Mike Inglis, uh, the time is yours. Right. Thank you very much um, uh, for all the kind words and for inviting me to talk. And I apologise for timing problems with uh, <laughs> online. I'm still unfortunately unable to share my video, as it would have been very nice to to <laughs> at least for you to be able to see me but let me at least share my screen um and um you can tell me i hope if you can see it if that's looking okay yeah look very nice and clear okay <laughs> thank you um so let me try and have a journey um uh, as dr uh Upi said um, I, I spent a lot of my career in Kenya, um, living and working um, mostly in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. And, and I'm going to use an illustration of some of the early work and how it progressed to give you an idea of uh, what I've called a collaborative research journey here. 
Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, I, I'll give you a, a minute or two on what on Oxford, just for those who <laughs> don't know anything about it. We've had the pleasure of having Dr. Upi and others visit. Um, but then I'm going to remind people that nothing happens quickly, <laughs> and uh, we 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 need to have long-term ambitions and work towards them, um, and point to some of the things that may happen in the future. So just a quick for those who don't know anything about Oxford, um, it's not the oldest um, European university, but it's just about the oldest, um, and. Uh, <laughs> It, with great age comes some significant challenges, so it's not always the most flexible um, uh, and innovative of institutions when it comes to an organisation, but it is a very... Uh, I, I only really returned to Oxford in 2019, um, and it's been a very interesting place to work because of the range of disciplines um, one can interact with. It's a large university, but not, not the biggest university. And I showed you a picture of the older part. Um, it does have some modern parts um, and is continuing to grow. Um, and obviously, the thing I've enjoyed about being back in Oxford after so many years in Kenya is the ability to interact with so many other scientists, not just health scientists. My department, the Nuffield Department of Medicine, is linked to the, um, the hospital that's in Oxford which is by no means the biggest hospital because Oxford is not a big city. Oxford as a city is, is only 250,000 people. Um, but the university medical school and departments are linked. And as you can see from the bottom, there is a huge range of research just as part of the Nuffield Department of Medicine. And there are other departments, including the Nuffield Department of Primary Health Care and the Nuffield Department of Population Health Sciences and the Nuffield Department of Surgery, etc., etc. Um, so we are a very big research university. Um, uh, it's a major part um, and health research is one of the biggest areas in terms of the research activity of the university. Kenya, some people may not so know so much about Kenya itself. Um, it's an East African country there on the coast of the Indian Ocean. Um, you can see on the left of your screen, it's the one um, shaded red. Um, in the middle, you can see that we have had some interesting neighbours, or still have some interesting neighbours, with a range of challenges. Um, so Kenya is bordered to its east by um, Somalia, to its north, uh, Ethiopia, and to the northwest by what is now South Sudan, um, and then to the further to the west, Uganda, and to the south, Tanzania. Um, the the map on your right. You can see the yellow shading in the upper part of the outline of Kenya. That's indicating that it's a lot of the country is semi-arid um, and is it has essentially historically been populated by um, many nomadic peoples um, because it it doesn't support typical agriculture. So Kenya still has quite a um, a nomadic population um, that travel with their animals um, across vast parts of the country. But you can see where the um, shading is darker green, that's where the rainfall is much higher. Um, and that tends to be where it supports the more uh, stable agriculture. And therefore, it supports a much greater proportion of the population. So the population density is much higher in those areas. And you'll see later from the map of our network that, not surprisingly, therefore, many hospitals are concentrated in the higher population areas. So Kenya is a growing country. It's nothing like the size of Indonesia, um, but it's 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 a fairly substantial East African country. Its population is is over 50 million. We're actually not entirely sure what it is. Um, it's still growing. Um, like many low middle income countries or low income countries, it's a relatively young population. Um, so as a pediatrician, <laughs> I, there are, there's much more need for pediatricians in, in Kenya than there is in the UK, for example, where we have a much, uh, our demographic pyramid is, is quite different. Um, so, uh, and I, I suspect there may be some similarities uh, with certain, certainly parts of Indonesia in your demo, in the demographics. Um, Kenya, although it's graduated to low middle income status, actually has quite 
significant inequity. So there is still a very large number of people living in poverty. Um, so, uh, and you can see on the right side that unfortunately Kenya in its um, capital and in the other major cities is plagued by many informal settlements or, or slums um, where health statistics are often the worst of, in the entire country, even worse than the rural areas. Um, so, but Kenya has done reasonably well at reducing overall under five mortality um, and the persistent problem for Kenya is uh, with neonatal mortality um, in the under five age group. But we also now as under five mortality improves, we are recognizing the importance of um, poor health and even mortality in children who are older than five in and in the adolescent period. And uh, obviously the link with maternal health is both at the beginning of life. If we can't improve maternal health and maternal care, then we will continue to have problems with neonatal mortality, but also at the end of childhood um, in adolescence, um, then there's a we're linking again with people in maternal health because of the uh, reproductive health issues for particularly adolescent uh, girls. But um, also just to point out that um, Kenya um, has too few health workers, which I think is a common problem across many countries. And in particular, there are relative, really quite few um, medical doctors in um, in Kenya, particularly working in the public sector. And we have a, um, a predominant public sector when it comes to hospitals, although the private sector is, is by far the biggest when it comes to um, walk-in ambulatory care. So this is just to give you an indication of how Kenya structures its healthcare system. Um, the, it's trying to shift from left to right on your screen. It used to have a six levels of um, the system, but when it changed into a, uh, with um, what we call county governments, which are now we have 47 small ministries of health in our country of 55 million. Um, because the counties actually hold the budgets for their health system. Um, and so essentially what we've moved to or are moving to is a four tier system with some facilities that are funded by the national government and run by the national government. But below that, um, the health system is run by the county governments um, and uh, hence the, the slight um, reduction in the number of tiers. So that's a little bit about Kenya. Um, I, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, have worked with um, the, what's been an, a very long-standing collaboration between University of Oxford and the Kenya Medical Research Institute that has been supported traditionally by funding from Wellcome. Um, so although, so Wellcome do not actually have any active role in Kenya doing anything. Um, the reason why they are still part of the name of the institution in Kenya, which is the Kemri Welcome Program, is, is to recognize their long-term funding. But the real link is between the University of Oxford and the, um, the Kenya Medical Research Institute, which is the National Research Institute um, for Health Sciences and Medicine um, in Kenya. The, this collaboration has been going over 30 years um, and uh, the major site for the collaboration is actually on the coast of Kenya in a relatively small town because many of the initial projects started around the problem of dealing with malaria um, in East Africa. Um, and that uh, facility has grown enormously and I've indicated there on the left it probably has 750 or 800 personnel. Um, uh, so there's a huge range of research that happens down in this research centre in, in the coast of Kenya. Um, and it hosts a very large demographic and health system of nearly 300,000 people in terms of its ongoing monitoring. Um, I worked originally in the Khalifi station before it had their lovely new building you can see on the left, um, and then transitioned to move to the Nairobi offices, Nairobi being the capital where we could in interact much more with the Ministry of Health and the national government. Um, that building in the picture is not our building. We, that's where we have our offices um, and that's where I spent a number of years. 
and within Nairobi we have the three departments or three units which um, uh, link most closely with the national government and now the county governments um, and the one I was responsible for starting is now called the Health Services and Implementation Cluster, um, which is now led by uh, my Kenyan colleagues. So uh, I said I'd take you on a bit of a journey. I just wanted to give you an indication of where this all started. So I started work um, on quality of care, um, I think, in, in one sense, before it was become a global health um, buzzword. <laughs> Um, so back in oh, well over 20 years ago, um, I, I started, I, I did a series of studies with the national government going across Kenya, um, which was only half, almost only half the size at that point, um, going across the uh, country, looking at what type of care was actually being provided in what in the district hospital level, um, which is also called the first referral level or the first referral hospital. Um, so the district hospital was of, was of interest to the World Health Organization in the 1980s and the early 1990s as part of primary healthcare systems. And uh, we, I, I set up a team with the national government to try and find out what was actually going on, focused on pediatric and neonatal care. Um, and essentially, what we found over 20 years ago was that the was that the care that was being provided in these hospitals was really very poor. Um, and essentially that started um, lots of um, lots of questions about what we could do about it. Um, so let me continue, but um, Dr. Upi, if you need me to stop and answer questions, please, please let me know. Yeah, you can continue first. And then okay. We will, we will invite the student uh, in the session of the question and answer. <laughs> Thank you. So this was early work and was quite descriptive, but quite important um, because it essentially it raised the question, what are we going to do about the problem of poor quality care? Um, and maybe this is just an example of some of that what we were finding those years ago. I hope it's visible on your screen. But on the left in the picture, you can you can see a, a colorful cloth that's actually wrapping up a small baby. And you can see how they were trying to keep that baby warm next to an electric heater, which, you know, uh, obviously this is a, a disaster waiting to happen in patient safety terms. For those of you who've got good eyes, you will also see that the, the resuscitation or the ambu or the ambu bag that's there actually if you look at the where the mask is supposed to be the mask doesn't have a rubber seal um so essentially this was a hospital that was providing neonatal care which was completely unable to provide safe and effective care i'm sure well i hope you don't see the is issues like the picture in the middle with a sharps box that's overflowing kenya at this stage had a substantial hiv problem because arvs were not really available in these early days um, and this is also a massive quality and safety problem. And I, I hopefully you don't recognize the picture on the right. The picture on the right is actually the way people were trying to give oxygen to multiple babies. Um, they didn't only have one cylinder, so they got put oxygen into this old intravenous bottle and use intravenous giving sets to distribute <laughs> the oxygen to multiple babies. So we were talking about a very poor system um, and that, that was our starting point. So we recognized that these hospitals had very limited resources and very few skilled personnel. So when we started this work, it was very unusual for a district hospital to have even a single pediatrician. Um, and they may not, they may only have in an entire hospital of maybe 200, 150 to 200 beds, they might only have uh, three or four qualified doctors. So there were limited resources and very few skilled personnel. Um, and the practice that people were following was extremely poor. And so one of the things that we did um, early on, uh, going back to 2005, was, was start to develop national guidelines that could be used across the country that recognized the resource limitations and this level of skill for the people in these hospitals. 
So we developed Kenyan guidelines and we did a lot of work developing uh, you doing Cochrane or Cochrane like reviews so that our guidelines were were evidence informed. We worked, as you can see from the picture, with a very large number of participants, medical people, nursing people. We have clinical officers who are non physician clinicians. We work with policy makers, people from hospitals, people from universities, so that everybody would agree on this on the guideline or the standard of care that should be provided in these settings. Um, that was reasonable to expect given the resources they had. And as part of this work, we then contributed to the development of the first copy of this um, WHO book that some of you may be familiar with, um, The Pocketbook of Hospital Care for Children. Having developed a local guideline which was easy to produce and easy to disseminate, we then developed a training course in how the, in the skills that people actually needed and I'm sure in Indonesia you have many um, well-trained professionals who, who do courses like um, PALS courses or advanced cardiac life support. In when we started in Kenya, there was very little of that happening in the government sector. And it didn't seem sensible to train somebody in advanced pediatric life support if actually they were struggling even to have an oxygen cylinder. So we adapted the training to make sure it was suited to the equipment and the level of resource that the hospitals had. And we also ad adapted trainings um, that were using the models from the, um, from the West, because um, again, I'm sure some of you have been in more rural settings in Indonesia or elsewhere. If you're the young doctor or the senior nurse in one of these hospitals and you have to try and resuscitate a baby or treat a very severe illness, it, there is no team that you then call <laughs> who will arrive and take over and take the problem um, and then sort it out. You're not only the team or the small team or the individual who has to resuscitate, you then have to manage the patient for the next 24 or 48 hours. So our course deliberately focused not just on resuscitation, but the practical management steps that were needed for the first 48 hours. So this training became known as ETAT Plus, um, and basically, I won't spend any time on this, we have revised this whole approach now six times, and each time we've had national level meetings on what the evidence should be, we've revised the, the protocols or the guideline books, we've revised the training, and we've de importantly, we've developed a pool of instructors, which is now over 150, um, who can offer this training to any county hospital that, um, that requires it. And perhaps most importantly, the training and the guidelines are also part of the medical school undergraduate curricula. Um, the, our clinical officers and our nurses have some of the materials as an examinable subject, which means that there's a strong national understanding of what the guidelines are aimed at these district level facilities. So we are not claiming that these are the guidelines for the national hospitals um, where there are pediatricians, but these our guidelines are mostly focused on those who do not have pediatric and specialist pediatric and neonatal training. I suspect in Indonesia it's quite similar, but in Kenya, if you graduate in medicine and you can then go and work in a district hospital and you may well be in charge of a ward and across the six years of your medical training, you've perhaps had eight weeks of pediatric training um, and you're now in charge of a pediatric ward. Um, so we wanted to make sure that those people had appropriate skills, at least to do the sensible things correctly. And as I say, we've continued to update this um, over a number of years. And I won't go through this, um, but essentially the, the approach has um, become a, uh, almost a national program um, and it's run independently of us and it's now run by the universities and the National Pediatric Association who offer this training um, to those who need it and as I say it's a training that brings nurses, doctors, pharmacists, uh, nutritionists, um, nurses and clinical officers, they all do the training together. We can train a professor together with a junior nurse um, we can have a junior nurse training a professor if the junior nurse has shown herself or himself to be a fantastic um, 
uh, you, you know, who, who, who performs extremely well on the course, then they're the people we identify to become trainers. Um, so it, it's, uh, the idea is that it also promotes a bit of interprofessional respect um, uh, and hopefully a bit more teamwork. In. And as I say, it's become a growing family um, with uh, essentially has be become part of what is normal now in many Kenyan institutions. Um, and it's also spread well beyond Kenya um, to several countries um, in East and in now West Africa. Um, and in fact, is also being used, I understand, in Myanmar um, uh, as well. So those were some early days, if it's like setting up the groundwork. Um, then the issue was, well, do these types of approaches to improving quality of care work? Um, and so I'm a researcher. I unfortunately don't get paid to, um, <laughs> or I, 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 you know, the people don't pay me to run courses or, um, yeah, or to go around doing improvement projects. Um, so we've, what we've been, what we have to do is ask research questions that enable us to focus on quality. So one of our major research questions was, can you improve care in these low resource settings? And I think we were one of the first, um, did one of the first major implementation trials where we actually randomized hospitals to different forms of intervention to see what magnitude of effect we could achieve with, um, with a set of um, implementation tools. And I'm pleased to say that we did achieve an effect um, and we were able to show that you can uh, quite substantially change practices of whole hospitals um, in their delivery of pediatric care. This um, work, and as we were trying to do this kind of work, <coughs> this is not just about teaching people clinical skills. We're actually trying to change the way that practice happens. And that is a form of health services and implementation research. And to help us do that, we had to start thinking much more carefully about um, why people change uh, or why they don't change. Um, in implementation science, people often talk about facilitators and barriers. Um, we take a slightly broader view um, uh, about and uh, think of things as more change processes. And one of the points that we recognized early on was the critical role that um, clinical leaders have in facilities. And we started collaborating with people from business schools um, because the business schools have many decades of research on managers and leaders, clearly. Um, and the area that became most interesting to us is what the business schools call mid-level managers. and many of you may be listening have managerial roles as senior clinicians or if you're a junior clinician you will find yourself in a managerial role at some point in your career um, and very few people get trained for that but you suddenly find yourself having to run a ward or run a department and your the way you do that is really very important but is ignored in most healthcare training institutions at least um, it, it is in kenya and and the uk so we've done quite a lot of work on clinical leadership um and what are called in the in the theoretical um literature hybrid clinical managers um and how you can empower clinicians to be better managers I'm not talking about people doing the financing or financial management of the hospital. I'm talking about the people who is the person that or the small team that are responsible for running an emergency department or running a maternity unit or running the surgical unit. Um, these are managerial skills. Um, and we've we've not just interested in um, doctors um, doctors obviously have their place, but like many other play countries, 70% um, of the health workforce in Kenya is our nurses. They're frequently ignored in, I would say, global health research, um, and, but are critically important. And we use multiple methods to understand the work that people do and what makes it difficult. Um, and 
the publication that you can see at the bottom is trying to understand how difficult it is for nurses in very low resource settings to actually do provide high quality care. Um, so rather than just complaining, we need to understand the problem. And this is some work that we did uh, a while ago, essentially thinking about the the relational roles that these that you as a clinician leader will need which is nothing to do with your technical skill as a doctor or a nurse or a, a pharmacist um, um, but these are the roles as i say that very few people pay attention to you and they don't explain to you and they don't train you for um in in, in your tr even postgraduate training that we have seen um and i'd like to emphasize um that for the people who are more involved in policy so policy it comes really at the senior management level there's very often a very top-down approach to policy implementation here is a set of things we want everybody to do and they then expect everybody to do it the people that will decide whether things actually change are often this mid-level leaders they will either ignore your advice or policy or they will try and adopt it if they try and adopt it then they, they then have to persuade all of the people that essentially work with them as a team or under them as a team to act differently and so these people in our mind are critical to policy implementation okay so this was a set of work that um took us some years and was in a relatively small set of facilities um between eight and twelve and then we began to wonder how we could do things at greater scale um and this is where i became interested um in the idea of learning health systems learning health systems have slightly different meanings to different people um there is a set of work from um, WHO is Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research, um, which talks about learning systems, which is an excellent read. Um, I take us the, the, the approach we took in our early years predated that and takes a slightly narrower approach um, and is basically focused on these four ideas. Can you create a network of engaged stakeholders? So not just the researchers, but the res in our case researchers practitioners policy makers as you'll see later can we work with the, the national information system so that we don't need both national data and research data can we use the same data and can researchers help support better national data if we've got data how do we use it can we use it to improve quality or to help promote implementation but can we also use the data to do um, research so that we can continuously improve um, the healthcare system? And what we started doing in, in 2013, so over 10 years ago, um, was, it seems very simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> How do you get every clinician to do a better job of documenting their patients? because it, it essentially whether it's a paper record or electronic record that that becomes data and if the person who's seeing the patient doesn't put the right thing down then your data is no good so we worked quite a lot on um improving health records um and then actually the management of the health records um in our case as you'll see we do not have an electronic record system for hospitals in kenya um and so we had to create a hybrid system um, and that meant managing the actual physical medical record so this is just an example of how we managed to transform the um the medical records in many kenyan hospitals is instead of having a, a sheet of plain paper that the young medical people used to just write their notes on we just created, not just, I mean, this took quite a lot of work. We created this highly structured medical record that was quicker for the medical people to use, but also provides much, much better data on the patients. And I won't go through all of this, but we did a lot of co-design work to see, to make sure that the way that the, this worked for the young doctors 
was actually helped them and was not slower. And in fact, it made their life much easier. And we took similar approaches um, to Im improving the the charts used for nursing and the charts used for writing the medicines and other things. And essentially, with these better paper records, that is, and none of this is done. The the seeing the patients is not done by any research staff. It's done by the young doctors. Um, or the other young clinical team members who first see the patient and it's done by the the, the government hospital health teams they write all of the med they write all of the medical records then what we've done as a research team is help support the collection of the data once the patient has been discharged and we link those date date synchronize those data with a server nationally um, and that allows us and that's done on a daily basis and that allows us to continuously create data and to use those data to create reports. And we provide the reports back to the hospital. So we show them what they're doing in terms of quality indicators we can measure. And I won't go through the system of all of this. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on it. But what then this, what the network is, um, we have a place um, as researchers under the uh, Kemri Wellcome Trust, you can see on the right of your diagram, but we work with the Ministry of Health, we work with the hospital teams, and we work with the National Association and also the universities. And we actually work as a network. We meet, we talk, we redesign things, we have WhatsApp groups, we have webinars, so that the network itself is working, um, is feels connected and is has shared goals. Um, so, as I said, we started in 2013, um, we've been going uh, uh, just over 10 years. We now operate across 24 hospitals um, in Kenya, and you can see the map of Kenya on the left. And as I explained earlier, many of the yellow dots uh, appear clustered because that's where the population density is highest. And it's also for feasibility reasons. So I mentioned that what we do is we use the data and we provide reports back to the hospitals, each hospital um, with, and they've, they've helped us agree what indicators they want to be judged by. And we provide reports on their progress. And then we, the hospital, it's up to the hospital to take on further improvement work. But we try and encourage and support and mentor the hospital teams to do that work. But we don't actually send people to hospitals to do improvement work. This is part of our early results where we started um, assessing or making sure that each child who was admitted to hospital had had an HIV test um, was, was rare when we started. And if you just follow the the black line you can see that it over about 18 months we were able to achieve uh, a target across all hospitals um, of at least 80 percent of children who when they were admitted had an hiv test done so that antiretrovirals could be started immediately um, so that we were not missing cases of hiv so that's one example of uh, improvement that happened in the early part this is a bit slight, appears slightly messy graph, but it shows you the value of having long term data. Uh, don't worry too much about the different um, periods. But if you just look from left to right, this is using data from across all the hospitals to show that the use of pulse oximetry has now improved quite substantially so that every child who's admitted gets at least one pulse oximetry, oximeter measurement um, so that we can detect those who have hypoxemia more accurately. But you will notice that it has taken six years for the hospitals to reach a target of 80%. And we do not provide hospitals with pulse oximeters. Um, and the government has been slow to provide them. And we've used this evidence to show the government that they need to do more to improve oxygen systems. Um, but it has taken six years, so this is not quick. 
we've been able to use I, this is so we I, I could give you other examples of the improvement work but here I'm going to now talk about how we use exactly the same data for the research purposes so we were able to show using all these data from the hospitals that if the a blood transfusion for severe anemia is delayed by more than 24 hours there's an 80 percent increase in the odds of mortality um, again allowing us to argue for improvements to the blood transfusion system we were able to show that uh, clinicians who are able to accurately prescribe intravenous fluids for children which actually young doctors find very difficult um, but when they the ones that prescribed correctly their patients had a 30 percent reduced odds of mortality and we were able to use um, the data and these are large studies um, and that's the advantage of working across multiple hospitals um, we were able to use the data um, to inform Kenya's decision on whether to adopt the new pneumonia guidelines um, that WHO had been recommending and in fact Kenya decided not to adopt them in the way that um, the World Health Organization had recommended because we had data which suggesting that could be cause problems this is another example now of how to use data across multiple hospitals <laughs> I, I again it's a large number of cases in this case over 90,000 neonatal admissions and each dot on this chart you can see represents the mortality rate or the mortality proportion of of, of one hospital so on the left hand axis you can see the proportions so the if you look at the red line going across the the graph the average mortality is about 40 percent for this group of babies between 1000 and 1500 grams but you'll each but the dots from the hospitals are quite variable and this is what's called a funnel plot which shows essentially the outliers so you'll see that there are some hospitals with a 60 percent mortality for this eight for this um, weight group and there are some hospitals with a 30 percent mortality so this allows us to start asking questions about why hospitals have such different mortality rates for similar populations. Um, and we've used uh, this similar data sets. These are all from the, the same hospitals to learn how to predict mortality um, so that we can, uh, we can look at a hospital and say, well, what is the expected mortality rate for your newborns dependent on your case mix, which is important. Exactly the same hospital system and exactly the same data source um, and exactly the same data collection mechanism has been used in to to track what happens with the uh, the implementation of the malaria first malaria vaccine in Western Kenya. So we didn't have to set up a new trial site or new study sites. We just used the existing hospital data to understand what how what would happen in when they introduce the new vaccine to severe malaria cases. We have used the exactly the same hospitals, exactly the same data, um, and but this time layered on top an individually randomized controlled trial, and this led by my colleague Ambrose Agueo, which has actually now finished just finished recruiting 4,200 severe ca cases of severe pneumonia. Um, and the results of that will be reported um, soon, but this this is the biggest ever study of severe pneumonia um, that's been conducted. We're using exactly the same system <laughs> to do a cluster randomized trial on whether we can reduce prescribing errors. So this in this case, we randomize the hospitals to different types of feedback, focusing on the pharmacists and senior doctors to see if we can reduce the errors that young clinicians make in prescribing gentamicin which is a complex drug to prescribe in the in the small babies and we're doing a, a another study where we are uh, using a quasi-experimental design to examine the impact on quality of care of improving nurse staffing so essentially by building up this clinical information network we've been able to do a lot of improvement work at national level, um, understand policy implementation, but also undertake a lot of research 
and I haven't highlighted so much yet the qualitative research that has been extremely important. So we've been using the same network to understand mothers' experiences of care, to look at implementation studies, um, to do co-design, to examine social networks, um, to see how influential they are in the dissemination of innovations. Um, and I've talked I've talked mostly about pediatrics, um, but in the last five years, we've also added internal medicine data to our system. And there's been another randomized controlled trial of dexamethasone um, in severe pneumonia. Um, because as in Kenya, we were never able to know who had COVID and who didn't. So if dexamethasone is being used for possible COVID, it could have been given to people who did not have COVID. We are um, interested, I mentioned earlier in theory, so we try and make sure that when we intervene, we've carefully thought about how we're intervening and why, and you, I'm not expecting you to look at everything on the screen, but this is one example of our theorizing of how this network should you should work, who it is that we're trying to change, why would they change, and what do we need to do as a network um, to enable people to change so that we get the improvements in healthcare that we, we desire. And if you like, this is a summary of some of the things that the network does. Um, it, we do performance feedback, we recognize good performance, hospitals are able to benchmark themselves against each other, hospitals decide what it is they're trying to achieve so that they have goals. Within the hospital, we hope that the network supports local problem solving, local collaboration, but the network also allows hospitals to talk to each other. They get peer support from their peer group, they're able to reflect on their successes and challenges with each other and learn from each other. Um, and by working with them over time, we are building their leadership and management skills. And the people who are in the, the clinical leaders are hopefully therefore giving better supportive supervision and, and creating better skills in their local setting. So we're hoping that we have these two virtuous circles working as a result of the network. And essentially, um, because many of the people in these hospitals were quite isolated from one another, this sense of connection and being part of something that's uh, helping drive improvement, we feel has been extremely important. So, as I say, we have spent a long time thinking also about how you intervene um, and uh, what we call program theory um, and understanding the, from an academic perspective, how networks work. Just to highlight some fantastic people. So these are the colleagues that have, um, I've worked with over the many years in Kenya. These are what you can see people who are mostly clinicians or epidemiologists. Um, but also we have social scientists and anthropologists in our team in Kenya. This is the team I work with in Oxford. Um, and this is our current set of PhD students. Um, a number in Kenya, but a number in Oxford um, from several part, different parts of the world. I'd just like to finish really on what we're focused on now um, as a, one of our main activities um, is now, from Oxford, having worked in Kenya for a long time, we will continue to work in, with Kenya, but we're now working with people in South Africa and Uganda, and particularly interested in this, uh, the first referral hospital level, um, or the district hospital level and its role. So, on the right, hopefully this is something that you recognize. Um, there may be other versions of it, um, but I just pulled this off the internet. It's um, the right is an organogram of a stylized organogram of how the Indonesian health system is structured. Um, and I've put a red box around the district level. Um, so the type of work that we do is basically aimed at the district level would involve district hospitals might involve some I know you have a variety of different hospitals of different sizes, so um, essentially it's a bit of a mixed uh, where 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 our interests would sit with relation to the Indonesian health system is a little bit um, difficult uh, for me to know. 
but it's approximately at that level while inter while linking with the higher levels and the lower levels and you can see on the left in south africa again the idea of a district system is still prevalent in many many countries and and that's mostly our focus while thinking of how national institutions and and universities can support districts um with important research rather than just focus on subspecialty research so we've continued to work and think about the role of the smaller hospitals in in because we feel that they are an important part of primary health care systems um because if you're in a primary care facility if you've got a challenging case or a case that is beyond your competence you will refer that's the point of a primary health care system and our focus for a very long time has been who is going to look after the person that is referred and it's rarely it's rarely a specialist so i think i'm coming to the end um clearly uh i've got a huge team to thank um and it's been a privilege um uh, talking to you and i hope you've uh, found it interesting um, and I will stop there and pass back to you Dr. Upi. Yeah, thank you very much uh, Professor Mike Inglis. I think this is very interesting presentation from you and we can see the step uh, by step uh, how to design in Kenyan hospital and uh, if I look at the improvement it is like such as a stairs that uh, takes I think a long time. Um, Right now, I would like to invite, uh, the, because uh, right now we will uh, be in the uh, question and answer session, I would like to invite the students to uh, deliver uh, some questions uh, to Professor Mike English. We still have uh, maybe 20 minutes uh, for, this, uh, for this season. Also, if uh, the staff uh, from many programs, all. Uh, really want to deliver uh, the question to Professor Mike English also. We invite all. So, somebody maybe will raise hand or you can also uh, put your questions into the chat box. I think there is any question in the chat box, Dr. Upi. Uh, okay. Yeah. From Dr. Elsa. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Professor Mike English, I would like to write. Uh, I, I would like to read uh, the question from uh, Dr. Elsa Maria Rosa. Is there a data set from research with Kenya? I interested to make the article about the healthcare in Kenya. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'm not sure there is a single data set from research for Kenya uh, in the same way that I suspect there isn't a single data set for research from Java or Indonesia more widely. Um, it, there are there are a number of papers um, that talk about the healthcare system and, and its challenges and the successes. Um, so yes, that, that could be interesting. Um, I, I, maybe it's just worth saying that Kenya is is one of the African countries that has essentially is is stronger in health systems research than many others um and so there is probably more written about kenya than there is for many other countries in africa over so it means that uh, uh dr also we can learn from uh, the activities of uh, professor mike english with uh, many uh, kenyan uh, collaborators i think mm -hmm. yeah um is there any question from anybody i'm also really curious oh naura yeah naura uh, please naura you can open your microphone okay um i apologize beforehand for the lack of my camera video since there is an error from my side but i'm naura nadira from Amagung general hospital and as we all know, accurate data plays an important role in future planning to improve care in low resources setting. And you mentioned that there aren't that many computer or digital based um, resources to store the data. 
And what I would like to ask is, um, what are the strategic measurement to supervise the data collection to avoid human errors and avoid data inaccuracy? And how reliable the human resources to document such da data? And also, is there a theme from Oxford to facilitate the supervision? Um, thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you for the question. Um, it, it, I mean, it, for me, this is a huge issue. Um, uh, and I, I, I don't know the setting in Indonesia at all. So Kenya um, is in one sense a very innovative country. It It's trying to make itself what they call the Silicon Savannah. Um, so they have lots of people interested in technology and um, information management. Um, and But the huge challenge is is creating an integrated um, electronic medical record system. Um, and th it because it, it, one, it's extremely expensive, um, but it's also extremely challenging because of the nature of inpatient hospital data. Creating an outpatient database is, and, and so those are quite common. Um, they're not harmonized, but they're quite common in Kenya. And often where electronic medical record systems are linked to payment systems, um, then they are more likely to be implemented, but they're also typically much more focused on the information needed for the people who are paying or refunding or the social health insurance system. So the they're, they're often very poor at capturing clinical information. So I think there's a lot, uh, there's, it's a huge challenge. The UK government spent 12 billion pounds trying to develop a national hospital information system and failed. <laughs> um, uh, we have seen in Kenya, people trying to develop inpatient medical record systems and many, many of them have failed. Um, and it, I, 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 maybe in your most sophisticated hospitals, you have um, laptops on carts you have people with tablets so that you know when you've got 30 patients in an inpatient area and you've got 10 or 12 healthcare staff everybody can access the electronic medical record and and input data or look at data but the level of you know imagining that at a district hospital level um is really i think it's a huge challenge it will happen one day <laughs> but it's going to take a long time and in my well at least in africa and part, but part of the problem is people don't think of the clinical workflow and how the doctors and nurses and others will use the the technology um so that's not a very helpful answer <laughs> um what what we so but part of it is actually having the clinical people really very fully engaged at the time when the the, the information tools are being developed because a computer scientist or, or a data scientist will have no idea what is important clinical information. And if many electronic medical records essentially ask people to type free text into their info, into the into the electronic system, it becomes traditionally it's been very hard to analyze. So I, as you could as you can tell, I can I can talk for a long time. But what what we have focused on is um, very close supervision from the people from the clinical leaders of the local staff, and the but that only happens if the clinical leaders think the information is useful to them. So if the, if they only think they're being asked to give information to the national government, and the national government doesn't ever give them any feedback or doesn't use the data then then they won't be interested in providing quality data so we have lots of conversations with hospitals where we give them a feedback report and they say no 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 that's not right that's not accurate <laughs> but that opens up a conversation for us to say well let's make the data accurate and then we can give you accurate reports um but let me stop there it's a it's a big and complicated problem
Yeah, I think this is very good discussion. Uh, but actually, also, I really want to ask to Mike. I mean, that uh, right now Indonesia is moving to the uh, what we call this uh, big data, and then the government really ambitious to put all the data into we call this uh, satu sehat or one health. So it means many kind of the data related with the citizen, with, uh, which uh, connected with the uh, universal health coverage. Uh, and then to, this data uh, will be, you know, uh, centralized in the center of the government, uh, and and also uh, collecting the data from uh, Mosiandu district, uh, sub district, provincial, and then also uh, central uh, board uh, of the national level. Do you think? This condition, I mean, that the, this step also will bring Indonesia uh, can reach better the situation. I mean, that's uh, we can also, uh, I mean, uh, more progressive uh, in the development of the healthcare if we can collect all the data into uh, one uh, system. Yes, thank you. And I, I, I'm, I don't claim to be the world's expert on on health information systems. Um, so, um, I think that we need much better data, and we need need much better data analysis and much better data use. I think, that, and being able, working towards that goal, I think is is critical. And I think there'll be lots of learning to be done on the way. I think there is, um, and you know, having population level data that's linked to health care delivery data is is critically important. Mm. The one of the challenges and the bit that we've focused on mostly is capturing very uh, as accurate data as we can about an individual patient episode in a hospital. Mm. Um, and that is more difficult, um, and it's proven difficult in many countries, um, because because what we were trying to do with the learning system, our learning system, um, was see whether we could use patient data for local improvement, for national improvement, and the same data for research studies. So we we had quite a narrow focus on the nature of the data. But it's an area of data that's hard to capture, um, and and there's lots lots of data points. <laughs> um, so it, it is a particular that is one particular challenge. But the the broader issue of developing data systems is is hugely important. And I mean, just I was reading the World Health Organization and UN's report on child survival just this week. Um, and there are still only 25% of countries that ac can accurately count births and deaths. Mm. Um, so we have a long way to go. I think Indonesia is probably very far ahead of many. <laughs> but in Africa, literally knowing how many people exist in the country is a problem. <laughs> how many people are born. <laughs> so, you know, we have a long... And, and with if you want big data systems, which we will all have, you need people who understand the use of big data, people able to analyze it, people to, able to keep it secure. I mean, a colleague of mine explained to me that two thirds of health individual patient records in the US have been hacked. Um, it is a big problem, uh, the security of data. So I, it's just a huge, huge area, and I'm, I, I can only scratch the surface, and I'm not an expert in all of them, but it's we need to do it. <laughs> How to do it, I think we're still learning. Yes. Yeah. You are very correct. Yeah, especially about the security of the data. And uh, I hope that uh, the One Health in Indonesia, that will be uh, the right way we have to go, even though it is a long way to go, but uh, we are we have to be confident. I mean, that Indonesia has to be confident because everything will be finished uh, for this year. Um, 
Okay, I would like to invite the others uh, to have, if you still have any question to Professor Mike English. Ah, Ida Ayu. Ah, Professor Mike English. Mike, this is, uh, uh, we also have to guess uh, from all crew Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> who have yeah. joined with us in Hanoi. Yeah, Ida, I think you still remember her. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, how are you? Hi. Thank you, Dr. Ufi, for inviting me. Uh, and nice uh, to meet you again, Mike. I have a question. Might be this is basic question. Uh, yeah, I'm Ida. I'm from uh, Oxford University Clinical Research Unit based in Jakarta. So uh, my question is because um, I'm research assistant, so I am going to do my research soon. But I'm interested to um, to your story how you develop a collaboration research in Kenya. Um, what is it, your strategy when you choosing the uh, collaborators involve? I mean the government. Um, is there any challenges? What is the strategy? Because when I've seen your presentation, I think in a hospital they have very demanding job. So what kind of criteria that you uh, involve them uh, as uh, collaborators in the research? And the second question is that um, I think in your slide there is a very nice circles about the networks which is the Camry in the right side, um, and then other networks uh, as well. Are they part of the collaborators in the research as well, or um, uh, or others? Thank you. Um, thanks very much for the question, Ida, and nice to see you again. Um, sorry, my camera's not working, so I can't, <laughs> I can't um, say hello properly. Um, so I think, so the strategy for developing collaboration, um, it, it's really, hey, well, the first thing I think is we were trying, we started, we decided we wanted to do research that the government wanted us to do, not that we wanted to do. <laughs> so the when I referred very early in the presentation to the first work we did going to examine the quality of care in the hospitals, that very first piece of work that was designed with people in the Ministry of Health and with people in the University of Nairobi and the team we put together was actually the people were nominated by the Ministry of Health to be the research team um, and we presented that when we got the results um, the person who was then in charge the what we call the director of medical services for the country um, he asked, he brought us into his office to give him the feedback and he did it on a public holiday when he was still, you know, he was working. Um, and, you know, he, he wanted the results well before we wanted to publish them or anything. Um, so that was the first step. And when the results came, the, it literally was the question, things look very bad. <laughs> What do we do about it? And so it was the start of a conversation with people in the university, with people in the Ministry of Health about what we could do. And one of the one of the issues became, well, it was clear that when we went to Kenyan hospitals, the, the doctors and the nurses there had never seen anything produced by the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization have produced lots and lots of documents, lots of guidelines, lots of books. The people in the rural hospitals had never seen any of them. So they didn't have access to um, good information on what they should do. And that was the way we started, is trying to develop that information, trying to develop a way of teaching the people about the information, giving them the correct skills. And essentially it's been a always been a conversation um, about what what is important now and what we what we can do as researchers we can't do everything we're not we're not USAID <laughs> you know we we can't we can't mobilize 20 million dollars to 
re-equip hospitals or you know uh, things like that so we you know it, they recognize that we're researchers there's we we can only do certain things um but we try and do the research that is important to them and will feed directly into their agenda and when it comes to working with the hospitals it, it again we've had lots and lots of conversations with the people in the hospitals we recognized that um and maybe this is familiar for people in indonesia if you're a uh, if you're a pediatrician or if you're an obstetrician or if you're a surgeon in a rural hospital you're often practicing by yourself you don't have five surgical surgeons who are your colleagues in that hospital um you may be just alone um and so they were very badly connected you know they were and to be honest they were rather bored um because they couldn't do the work that they were trained for because the the hospitals were not well enough equipped to allow them to do their expert work so um we worked with them on what would interest them or what could be interesting to them um and also by bringing them together they found value in beginning to talk to their colleagues um about the problems they were having and what they could do about it um so if that's one important value of of the network is that it enabled these enable people to talk to each other about their problems and accept that some of them nobody could do anything about <laughs> um and it and but there were some that people could do something about um and i don't know whether that i've changed the slide is this the one you're referring to um so essentially when we talk about the network it, it does involve all of these organizations um all of these organizations are part of what we still have to put together as a research ethics proposal but there are people from all of these organizations who are part of that we we have b before covid we would have six monthly face to face meetings um with representatives from all these organizations and representatives from the hospitals and those and we after covid we've tried to restart those it's challenging because they're difficult to get funding for um but actually they're critically important we all know that uh we like to work with people we know <laughs> um and if you haven't discussed together what you want to do um and if you like agreed um that yes this is something we'll all try and do then it probably won't happen um so it is we try to make it a, a, a network of equal partners um but we have had to bring resources in the sense of the research and the data management capacity etc cetera, etc cetera. and we've benefited from it um you know we're honest about that um we wouldn't be able to get research funding without the without those partners we wouldn't be able to do a trial of 4000 individuals we don't you know we've we've done a clinical trial of 4000 people and there's only been two people in each hospital that are, that are, and they're low level people i mean not highly trained people who are supporting the clinical trial um so it's a, been a very efficient way to do studies and um uh, we don't try and hide the fact that we're benefiting with we, where and we want but we 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 try and make every, everybody gain ben some benefit but let me stop there thank you mike it's very enlightening advice for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ufi. Yeah, thank you very much, Ida. Thank you, Professor Mike Ingris. Um, I think due to the constraints of the time, so we have to finish uh, this discussion in the expert lecture. And I would like to give back the time to Dr. Farandira as a Master of Ceremony. And thank you very much uh, for uh, the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Upi, and also Prof. Mike English for the nice presentation and discussion with us. It's very inspiring. And okay, thank you very much again for all the participants, for your attention and for the question. And that's very excellent research trial also, Dr. Uh, Professor Mike English, and how you concept, deliver, and make uh, such a big collaboration also with the health system along the Kenyan country. 
and the more important thing is the successfully hospital network to the community also yes okay let's us give big applause to dr upi and also uh, professor mike and before we close this uh, agenda i would like to invite all the participants to open the camera uh, we would like to take the picture together okay we have a seven slide it's very long slide okay uh, and i will count uh, the first slide uh, okay one two three okay and then the next slide okay one two three third slide okay one two three okay and fourth slide yes it's very uh a lot of uh participants today <laughs> yes we have uh, almost 200 okay one two three okay and one two three okay once more and one two three okay Okay, that's all, uh, Professor Mike English and also Dr. Upi and all the guests today. Thank you very much. Uh, see you again soon uh, for the next uh, nice collaboration with us. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you very much, Thank Professor Mike English. Thank, Thank you so much. It was a privilege. Okay, have a nice weekend for everybody. Thank you. And also the iftar because it yes. will be close to iftar in the Ramadan. Thank you very much. Yes. Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye-bye.